Uh, next session is titled Increasing Practitioner Buy-in, Usability Testing, Communication, and Collaboration. Uh, speaking today is uh, Cheryl Warner, who's the Senior Director of Applied Clinical Informatics at Tenant Healthcare. Um, usability and, and this whole notion of getting uh, increased uh, buy-in is really important. Uh, I always say that IT is not an end, it's a means to an end, and I think sometimes we forget that and get caught up in the, in the nitty-gritty details of things. So uh, Cheryl's here to talk about how we can ensure that what we're doing is actually making it a difference and is, um, is what the end user is looking for. Cheryl? All right, thank you. Um, as Quam said, one of the biggest challenges we face uh, as we uh, uh, enjoy the journey to roll out the new technology is the buy-in from the end user and the resistance to change. Um, they resist change, they don't use the system, and the benefits that we thought we were going to gain, we do not gain because the system is not used. And so therefore, ROI is impacted. There's a negative impact uh, all over to our finances. And, but there are ways that we can certainly influence that in a positive direction. So we want to go through a few of those today. Uh, Three things, three things that we're going to discuss. Uh, one is how we can communicate and uh, collaborate more in inclusively uh, among all of the stakeholder and how that impacts buy-in in a positive way. Uh, secondly, we're going to learn how to define meaningful metrics and the data sources to measure change. And lastly, we are going to look at usability uh, and the strategy to improve ROI uh, and uh, while improving practitioner buy-in. So let's start with the communication and collaboration. A lot of this, and you all feel free to chime in, especially if you have stories or um, you have experiences that you think we would all benefit from. Um, a lot of the, uh, the communication and collaboration, we think it just happens. Or, you know, we're so focused on the technical aspects, the functionality, you know, meaningful use, targeted dates, and so forth, that we simply don't put enough planning effort into the communication for all of the stakeholders. So we're going to go through a few of the points and that you should always keep in mind uh, so that you make sure that your communication vehicle is well thought out and effective. One is to ensure that the right mix of people are involved and at the table. So this does not mean all of your early adopters. So your core project team is packed full of early adopters because that only represents a small sliver, a very small sliver, in fact, of your total population. You want to, in fact, go find you know, that the person who is one of the major resistors and bring them on to, onto the project team. One benefit of that is that you have lots of runway, all right? So versus encountering this individual during or at implementation or training, you know, this individual ha has been a part of the project team early on, has uh, taken some ownership if, if if he stayed on the project team. And so the resistance that you would encounter later, you encounter it early and you have a, a, a longer period of time to convert that individual. Um, you want to also make sure that you have representation from all of the business areas or the functional areas so that you're not making decisions for another a set of people. Secondly, you want to agree upon a methodology or a framework a governance model, if you will, that's going to be used. So again, we want to be inclusive, we want to be collaborative, but we do need to set some structure around that. What is the methodology that will be used? How will we handle changes? Who will make the decisions? If all of this is established up front as you encounter uh, a change request or some requests, you don't have to go through the uh, pain of trying to determine at that point, how do I handle this? More importantly, you don't have, you're, you don't have to worry about the other individual thinking you're not accepting his change because of, of already the battle scars that have t and, the, and some of the disputes that have taken place already. If you establish all of this up front, everyone knows the rules and it's easier to get through the process. Um, you also want to discuss and agree to 
abide by the laws, the various policies of uh, compliance regulations and standards and so forth. And this is a really good time up front to make the team aware that these instruments do exist and these are constraints and you, you, there is not carte blanche to we're going to all just run and do what we want, but we do have to operate within these boundaries. So if in, in, in the case of uh, some project teams, you want to invite those subject matter experts in, the compliance officers, the uh, officer, the security professionals, so that they can make the team aware. Even your you know, director of um, applications development, if there are coding standards in place, for example, you want to, the, 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 pro, uh, the project team to understand what those standards are so that they know. We, we had a discussion the other day about, you know, um, for some of the applications, the accept key is at the bottom. Then the, the X is at the top right corner. Sometimes it's over to the left. It, it's all over the place. And, and we talked, coding standards would have cleared that up um, instantly. It never would have gotten into production like that. Had the development team understood the coding standards and followed them, if, if the coding standards exist, and uh, then it, regarding uh, compliance, the production support team would not have even allowed that code into production if those coding standards had been violated. But this also helps to frame, to put a frame and a box around the project team so that everyone understands the limits. Uh, but we are a team, but we are operating within these constraints. These are our boundaries, and these are the roles that you play. Which brings me to uh, the third point, establishing ownership. And, and I, I say ownership in place of roles and responsibilities. You really want this individual to know regarding physicians, you're it. Everything associated with physicians, uh, we're relying on you to take care of that. And you want to set the expectations from the communications to obtaining their feedback, bringing it back to the core team. They own that space. It is true ownership. Um, next. We want to increase transparency to decrease distrust. So <clears throat> again, we're trying to impact buy-in from our end user community. Why don't they trust or what is it that uh, one of the problems or the, uh, the, one of the variables standing in the way of change is in some cases trust. If you make everything transparent, everything that the core team is doing, transparent, and, or, and you don't have to push it to the end user community, but you can certainly make it available so that they can go and get it. And then you also do need to have a campaign where you start to um, bring those back at the ranch along the journey, and they may not even know it, but you're doing it. So what does this mean? That you do put uh, posters or status in, in the uh, break rooms. You make sure that it gets announced in your all hands meeting that this is the team. These are the representatives on the team. If you have an issue with physicians or you have a suggestion, Bill is the person you want to go to and see. You can log into this site to see what our roadmap is, the progress that we're making, how far we've come. So you, again, we, we're trying to lengthen the runway for which we have that contact with our end user community. So early, the earlier, the better. And, and initially, we want to just provide a, an environment that allows them to kind of st t stick their toe in the water. Yes, Brian, I think. No problem. Mm -hmm. What's, okay, that's a great question. And there are multiple ways of doing that. So uh, one way that works very well is, uh, I mean, we use graffiti uh, brainstorming. So, but you need to, there are some rules there to follow. You put Put it, so for those of you who have never used it, it's just white paper or flip chart paper where you write down a question and you put a date, 
you know, this flip chart paper will be picked up the morning of, you know, 11.15 or whatever. And you post several blank pages. People can do it anonymously. They go and write. And this can also be done in, on your intranet, you know. Um, you can have your staff meetings and collect feedback at that point. There are various teams already in place, um, the advisory teams and so forth, that those, the feedback can come from that source. But once people get used to providing it, they'll go looking for it. You know, so what you want to do is that if you start the graffiti approach, and, and then people will see scribbles and what other people ha have written, that will invoke thoughts for them, and then they'll write something, or that'll stir some uh, creativity, and they'll go write something. So, but the point is, is that you collect it. Um, a lot of companies are using SharePoint. You know, so they put it out on SharePoint. Maybe the, the end users uh, get an alert, those who are affected get an alert and that, hey, this is out there and it's up to them to go provide feedback or not. I think the, the, the important part is that once that feedback is collected, it is stored where they can go see it and they can review it and it's out there for the, the life of the project team. So they can peruse it at their leisure and you may even want to put um, uh, how it was prioritized and those, that, those ideas that you decided to collect, capture, and or uh, and move forward with. So you, that's a, that is a good question. How are they kept informed? Okay, yes, Martin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, let me see if I have the question right. It takes time to go obtain the feedback from the end user, right? And, and in a lot of cases, the project team does not have time. So how do you handle that? Well, what I would submit to you is that it really doesn't take that much time. Okay, so if you think about it, how much time does it take to scribble a title on the top of a flip chart paper and the date that you're going to pick it up? Because they need to know, okay? You, you have until 11.15 to, to write your, your comments down here. And I think we all are, are, maybe I'm making an assumption, but we've, typically on project teams, you do have some admin support. So you can just go take the flip chart paper down, fold it up, and give it to your admin support to document into the, the data store for the project team. Again, that's one way. Um, it works well. Again, it depends on the end users. You want to know who you're dealing with and you want to figure out a way to get their feedback. We want to include these individuals. So maybe, for example, the graffiti method would work well for your dietary staff. Okay. But maybe for another staff, they can go straight into SharePoint and just type it in themselves, where you, it's already there, you have it. And so I, I think for the benefit that you gain, I really think that it, you don't have an option to engage your, your end users as soon as possible. That will even let them know this project is underway, this is coming, and so, you, again, you don't spring it on them where they get some alert that, hey, next Tuesday from 1 to 5, you're in training in this room. And, yeah, they heard a little something, but they really didn't know. You know, so you want to just, again, we want them to own it. We want to just continue to push. And as IT professionals, we really should see ourselves as instruments or you know, facilitators, it's not our system. You know, we have the expertise to develop, to make sure it meets their needs, to put solid products out there. But we want them to own it. We want them to be heavily engaged. We want to include as many of these individuals as possible so that we get the returns that we expect once the system is implemented. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that's a good idea. We, we certainly want to have representation from the end user community from all of the functional areas and the business units that are impacted up front without question. We want to extend though that um, the project team to those who may not be a part of that core project team with getting feedback from them. For example, if you're considering five types of uh, screen designs, screenshot them and put them up there and, and have them you know, put their input. So you get the benefit of knowledge from not only that core team, but the entire team, those who want to participate all across the hospital. So they may not be, again, a member of the core team, but you've gained the benefit of their knowledge. So I thought I saw his hand. I'll be right to you. Go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're, you're exactly right. That's the, the last point on the page is to make sure that your executive team is visible uh, to the project team and the project team is visible to the executive team because that will certainly help um, tap down any potential acting out that uh, maybe your resistor might do. If, if they know that from time to time a member of that executive uh, steering team is going to visit the project's team, come to a meeting, say, how's it going, you know, stay two or three minutes and leave, and they know they're on the team. Again, you, you want to do what you can to push that ownership out, but executive visibility and, 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 and participation, and a lot of times, okay, so as a, as a leader, the executive doesn't even have time to keep up with everything. And if, if you are the leader of that project team, you may have to give that individual crib notes. You may have to ghostwrite an email or two, or here's, you know, we've achieved uh, these things, and it's time for some reward and recognition. You may have to write that up for that individual, but it needs to come from that individual. All of these things make the project team inclusive, collaborative, and, uh, and the communication is out to the entire user community because we have opened it up for feedback here and there. Now, you don't want to saturate them. Okay, every week, here's some other graffiti uh, brainstorming session that's going on. You know, at first, you may want to do something once a month, but the closer it gets, you know, and then it kind of it peaks, and then, of course, as we head into implementation, it, it tapers off. But you have to plan these events because it's like anything else. You have to keep this project front and center in front of the end users. This is coming. This is a product for you. And here's what we're doing. It, it really is a part of marketing, but it is inclusive. It's a communication vehicle, and uh, it will certainly go uh, light years when it comes to adoption because they've seen it, they've heard it, they know about it, they've participated in it. They had a voice, and that is so important. I'll come to you. Mm -hmm.
Exactly. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. So one of the things, um, and we're going to go more into that, is user acceptance testing comes at the end, right? And it really is a bit late. You know, I mean, it it it, it really is um, more so to satisfy contractual obligations. So, okay, did the did the delivery organization deliver? Have we? have all of our requirements. It's like if we go through and we make sure and we check the boxes. We want to get them involved, though, way up front during the design. We want them involved from the beginning where they help identify the requirements. Here's what I need. We don't want to make any assumptions. So you're exactly right. We're definitely going to keep them involved back here. But we want to pull that involvement ahead in the project where they're involved up front. They ha there is representation, again, on the core team where it is going to take an investment of time from that core team member. But we also want to use these methods and ways to extend out to maybe we have uh, well, there's no maybe two. We will have individuals that are not a part of that core team, which is usually seven plus or minus two people on the core team. And then, so there's a representative from nursing. And when, when this individual has to make decisions, what will she do? And this all has to be determined up front to go back and seek input from the entire nursing population. So is she going to use the graffiti method? Will she go from, from stand-up meeting to stand-up meeting? rattling off questions, getting feedback. Will she send out emails? I mean, it has to be something that is effective. So you're exactly right, and, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, let's move into specific ways to collect metrics, identify and define metrics, and collect metrics to measure change. Okay, so we're talking about individual change. One method that is tried and true is force field analysis. It's, I know it's been a long time since some of you have heard that, but it really does work, where you identify those inhibitors of change, and then you identify the drivers of change. So, for example, let's just take our current situation. We are implementing EHR. Okay, so the drivers, federal government, incentive payments, better you know, patient care and safety, it goes on and on. These drive are driving the change. What's preventing the change? Physician adoption. What else? Cost. Maybe. What else are you running into? Resistance to change. You would identify those things on the, the, the left side of the chart. It doesn't matter, okay? Here's what's driving them. Here's, here are those inhibitors. These are those forces of change uh, that are against change. Then you want to score them. You know, one being minor, five being off the chart. So you score each one of them, and you come up with a total score. So now you've identified, and again, you can never identify them all. You just want to get the major ones. And it may be a list of 20. You know, you don't want every little nit because you're going to have to develop actionable action items to go and assign owners because what we have to do is to um, increase the forces that are driving the change. We have to upset that balance. We have to either increase the forces that are driving change or decrease those forces that are against the change. Because change is not going to occur until one of those things happen. You have to alter the state, right? Okay, so 
if you have identified all of those forces, those for change, those forces against change, and you've scored them, and you have a total, so you know, okay, we've got to do something. It's very easy to publish that. Again, we're trying to uh, decrease distrust, which is also an inhibitor of change. So you want to just publish it. Put it on your website. This is what the team has come up with. And by God, we're not sticking our heads in the sand. We're hitting it head on. Head on. So a team is in place to address this inhibitor of change. It, it scored a five. We had five that scored five. So there are five teams that are in place. And once they knock those out, we're going to put those people, deploy those resources on those forces against change that scored a four. Maybe there are some low-hanging fruit down there, ones or twos that you can use. You can also use those forces for change to affect those forces against change. If you have executive leadership that's on board and you've identified something over here that they can influence, assign it to them. Here's, here's what we're, this, this will this will cause us to fail. If we don't alter the state here, we will not succeed. We will implement this system and they will not use it. We've identified these things. We believe that you can influence these three. We're asking that you do it and here are the results that we're expecting. You know, um, can we rely on you to, to take care of this for us? What are they gonna say? I mean, especially after you publish it, you know, the CEO, uh, owner, CEO, you know, due date or whatever it is. So you have to be tactful about it, but, but this is an all hands on deck kind of a thing, okay? So again, we want to identify the forces driving and opposing changes, score them according to the magnitude, one being the weakest, five being the strongest, and de develop measurable action items to either increase the forces that are driving the change or decrease those that are resisting. Does that make sense? Okay. Next, usability. Um, so we want to, now here, this is a difference. So we, usability can't be substituted for user acceptance. Usability takes place very early on in the project, and it has to take place during the design phase. We are trying to design a usable product and lock it down. That way, and, and the users have to be involved so that when we get down to user acceptance testing in the end, it's going to fly through because we've done all of this upfront work. So let's talk a little bit about um, usability testing. It measures learnability, efficiency, mem uh, memorability, errors, satisfaction, and utility. So these are easy. How easy is it to learn the system? So if you have a complex system that's going to require, it's like, oh my God, you know, and, and so you've got binders of help, help online help, it, this is a complex system, you know, that's going to, that will certainly influence the end user's willingness to use the system. They don't want to use it. It's too complex. Okay. It's too hard to learn. Yeah, I went to training, but I can't remember it. Those kinds of things. Efficiency. Well, okay, once the users have logged in, how quickly can they perform their task? Is it a quick boom, boom, they're out. Okay, they're typing. Doesn't matter whether it's upper or lower case. They don't have to memorize any syntax. They're in, they're out. How efficient is the system? Memory. When the users leave after an extended period of time, how easy is it for them to come back and jump right in? Okay, it should be, they should be able to remember it or at least be triggered by things on the screen to be effective. Errors, so they're gonna make errors. How many errors do they make? How easy is it to recover from the errors? How severe are the errors? All of these things, all of these questions are answered during use, uh, usability testing. Because when they make errors, if they hit a wrong key or they fat finger something or get into a screen, how easy is it to back out and get back where they are? Okay. If that's easy, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. People won't fear using the system, but if hitting the wrong key, 
okay, now here's this blue screen, oh my gosh, you know, then that's going to certainly influence their willingness to use the application, to use the system. So we want uh, a system that's easily, that they can recover from errors easily. Satisfaction, you know, are they satisfied with the design? This is not just the colors, how it looks, you know, wow, it's, it, it's you know, the, it's the content. It's how do you authenticate, we were talking the other day, yesterday, maybe the day before about authentication, okay? Let me just give you an example. If, for example, um, you know, a, an end user logs on, and then it comes up, okay, who's your doctor? Okay, so I don't know if Weinberg is spelled W-E-I, you know, B-U, uh, R-G or W-E, okay, so now I gotta sort through this. And maybe I got it right, maybe not. And then here's the next question, you know, when was your last visit? Well, now I'm just stressed out, okay. That's not a user-friendly system. Okay, so let me give you another option. I bought a car three years ago, and when they pulled my credit report, actually, I had to go in a, a little room where the, it, and it asked me, okay, what was your last, it asked me questions that I would know, and it gave me choices. Um, you know, what was your, uh, your, did the home, your last home purchase, was it in this city, this, on this street, this city, this street, and you, you could automatically click. I was like, wow, you know. The next question, it, it was all things that I would know and they gave me choices. So I, that is a better way than having me recall because the first thing is I'm gonna, I'm frightened that you don't know who my doctor is. Or don't you know when I was last here? You know what I mean? So you don't want to frighten your users. Um, you want them to be satisfied, but you have to think about content, screen design, it, it's everything. You also have to think about the content of your help screens. If they hit help, is it easy? Does it, you know, if, or if you've given them, given them quick reference cards, because you, you're testing everything, not just the system. If you're expecting them to use quick reference cards or the help menus, those should be developed too and those need to be tested. Then finally, utility. Does the system do what it's supposed to do? Okay, then, so how do you conduct usability? Again, different from user acceptance testing, usability. First of all, it's conducted individual by individual. So it's not a focus group. You know, those are done for market studies and so forth. So we really want to know what you think. We want to know how, how the system is behaving and how you're interacting with it, if, it is, if, it's, if it's achieving the desired results. So I, as the, as the usability analyst, I'm watching, I'm quiet, and I'm taking notes. I'm watching the screens that you're on, and a lot of this, some, some places have, a, you know, elaborate usability labs with two-way mirrors, mics, I mean, the whole nine yards. But you don't need all of that. You can just do it with a pen and paper, and it needs to be in a conference room or somewhere where the, the person can actually go through the system, you know, the way they would if they were conducting their work. So you want one person, and you're watching. If you pipe up to show them how you've now contaminated the test results, that's not what you want. So you want um, to include representatives from all areas of the business. Everybody who's expected to use that system, we want feedback from all of them. The nursing team, the, the dietary team, the, the, the radiology, all of these individuals. If, if they're expected to use it, you should have input from all of them. You want to allow the end user to solve his own problems. So if he runs into a situation, again, either the help screens, your document, your, you know, your quick reference cards or, or whatever you're using should be able to help him recover from that error. If he, if he or she can't, that's good news. At least you caught it. Now you know. So you don't want to dive in, oh, click here, you know, no, backspace, good, you know. Now, 
you really don't know if it's usable or not because you've inserted yourself into the whole situation and contaminated the results. We don't want that. Okay? We want to observe. You're there as an observer. You take the notes. You want to observe what the users do, where they succeed, where they have difficulties in both the system and the training materials. If they're flipping back and forth and, and they're, you, they punch help and they're going from screen to screen and you saw what they were looking for were, was on the first screen but they're already 10 screens in, you need to make a note of that, all right? So here is some other observations. I just wanna share this with you. Uh, this is from my past and and then you guys, as you travel back to your prospective cities, you can watch people in the airport at the airport counters. Some nonverbal behaviors that will let you know what the end users are experiencing, right? Okay, so as you're watching during usability testing, again, you're gonna obtain all of this feedback and, and it should be iterative. So first you may wanna only start, let me just say this with maybe five, five users you know, five or six from, from all across the system, okay? And you, you conduct that usability test, you have the notes, you go back, you modify the design uh, based on the results of the test. You come back, you don't have to test that same person, you test another user, because you don't wanna wear anybody down or be too intrusive, because as you said, they do have day jobs, right? Okay, so you test, you test again. Um, you take notes, you see if those items that you needed to improve were improved and if they were able to get a little further or if something else cropped up. So it is an iterative process until you get a solid design that the last usability test, they're going through, okay, they're, and, and, and it's just clicking. So now you're, you're good to go and the, the project can proceed. So you have a solid design, usability testing is over, it can proceed to development and then testing where other application testing takes place and then user acceptance testing and then it's moved into production. So you have a solid design that the end users can use. It has passed usability. You have also, uh, your resistors of change, those efforts have continued where you have decreased those forces and hopefully increased the forces that for change. So you have solid metrics measuring change. If you have uh, those metrics are going in the right direction and they look good and you have a solid product where you have tested it with the end user community, they have been a part, an intricate part of the design. When you go into production, I think the chances are pretty good that the product is going to be well accepted, well, it will be used. And you will gain the, um, the uh, return on investment that you hope to gain because you've done the legwork all along the way. During um, usability testing, we want to uh, watch what people actually do because what people say a lot of times they don't want to hurt your feelings or yeah this was really good yeah yeah you know because they okay I just want to get out of here I got lunch or whatever it is you know so you don't you don't even really want to listen to what they say to you okay but when, as they're interacting with the application that's important and you do want to make notes all right so here are some things to watch for it for the nonverbal behavior okay. When people uh, hold their thumbs, and it can be one or both, okay, so you're watching for this. This indicates uh, anxiety and they're, they're, they're um, self-comforting. So they're anxious and somewhat insecure. So, in, and again, as you conduct usability, um, you'll learn all of this or you'll be given a list or something, right? So they're, they're insecure. Another one is, um, you know, that's shock. Oh my God, you know? So that could come if, if you're asking me who is my physician and when was I last here and what is it all, and you know, it's like, oh, you know. So it, you just wanna make note when did that, when did they do that and what screen were they on or what task were they trying to complete? So shock. Uh, another one is uh, pinching the bridge of the nose. Okay. 
This is contemplation and um, you know evaluation, but in a negative way. Okay, so I don't know how many of you do this. I mean, you 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 even know this, but you've probably never like really thought about it and to this depth. But if you conduct usability testing, you you will because you'll have to record that. So they're evaluating this, uh, you know, evaluation. Another nonverbal way users evaluate is the palm of the hand under the chin. So this is negative. So, you know, and, and it also could in, in, in indicate boredom or tired. You know. So it's just, uh, you know. If, if the hand is like this, so the, the index finger is up, this is a good evaluation. Okay. So this is good. This is bad. This is negative. You want to make note of that. Um, scratching the neck. Okay. This means that, you know, mm, I don't really believe this. I don't trust it. I mm, don't know. Yeah. That's, that, that's what that means. If, if they cup the neck, it, it's more fright. I'm, I'm kind of frightened here. They're literally protecting their jugular. I don't know that, but that's what they're doing. Okay, so this is this is not good. But you again, you're making no. Typically, you'll have all of these on the side, and as they as you're watching them, you're just checking the box and noting the screen wherever they are, because the, your note page is already filled out. So you're flipping to wherever they are and checking if if you see some of these behaviors. The hand to the back of the neck. This is uh, impatience. I'm frustrated. Um, this is not good. All right, um, the finger roll, okay, response time, something's, you know, okay, I'm waiting. Any, any quick motions where they're bouncing their knee quickly, tapping their foot quickly, impatience, that's what that means. Um, a slow tap is contemplation. I'm, I'm thinking about this but that's not negative. Anything quick, uh, that's negative. Um, when people grip their wrist, that's kind of anger. That's, that's really bad, you know, because they're literally having to hold themselves from doing something. Either, you know, throwing the machine out or, you know, grabbing you, but you don't, you, you know, if, if you ever see them holding their wrist, that, that's, we're really into a negative space. Another one is the, the grabbing of the head. This is, this is all out calamity, you know, just, oh God, you know. And you cannot go to market with a product where during usability testing, you've consistently seen this nonverbal behavior, right? Okay, um, let's see. Oh, ear tugging. This too is self-comforting. Um, it's indecisive, but I'm just feeling insecure. So we have the, the, the ear tugging, the thumbs in, okay. If you have your uh, interwoven fingers and, and they're clenched, you know, that's frustration. Again, you're holding yourself back from something. So. With that, I'll yield the floor and ask, are there any questions? And, you know, it's fun to watch people as they go to the counters and the desk and see if you see some of these behaviors, you know, and, and now you'll know exactly what's going on. You can be across the room and looking, and it's kind of fun to watch. But um, the bottom line is that, you know, we want to get good usability test results. We want to go back to the design. We want to... Uh, we want to course correct, go back. It's, again, it's an iterative process until we no longer are seeing and witnessing those behaviors. We feel like we have a good product. We have our metrics from our change, uh, our uh, force field analysis are going in the right direction and we have uh, influenced that. When we go to market, certainly after we develop, go through user acceptance testing and, and training and so forth and hit the market, with the product, we should be in a lot better shape. How many of you believe that if you were able to deploy some of this, you would 
have a better product. A lot of it is that, you know, our vendors, we are beholden to them and they do, it's kind of a vendor's market. We talked about this yesterday. But I think, again, the good thing is that NIST has come out has, with more focus on usability testing for healthcare systems. Um, it was in, how many of you are members of HIMSS? It was in the uh, magazine, I think, that came out this month that, that it will now be part of the certification for uh, meaningful use uh, stage two for the vendors. In order to get their certification, they will have to show that they have conducted usability testing and they will have to share those, some of those results. So it is important, it's helpful, it's beneficial, and I would suggest that you all uh, launch your journey for usability testing. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Bob. Obviously,
Thank you, Cheryl.